I want to talk to you guys today about something that's real important to my heart. And I, I know it is important to the Lord as well. Um, but I want, us, I want us as a fellowship, you know, part of my job here at my friend's house is uh, uh, to support Pastor Albert in him shepherding uh, the flock that God has given uh, to him, which are you guys. And one of the jobs I have is to prepare you for the work of ministry. But another job I have is to help you understand how to personally walk with the God you serve. That's one of the, the, the jobs that I have to do and I take very seriously. And part of that is modeling things in front of you. I, I have to model a walk with God. As one of your leaders, as one of your spiritual leaders, I have to model that walk. I can't uh, ask you to do something and I'm not doing it myself. So I have to model it. I have to model it in everything I do. You know, how I, how I speak, how I, uh, how I carry myself in public, how I address and talk to people that don't know the Lord. And that's important because God expects us to uh, respect those who don't believe, but at the same time, give every man a reason why you believe what you believe. And so being able to prepare you biblically and uh, emotionally and, uh, and, and help you work through experiences that you have with God is something that a shepherd does. And we try to do that here at my friend's house. Um, but what I want to talk to you about today is the title of the sermon is The Intimacy of Worship. The Intimacy of Worship. I'm going to try to communicate something that is almost uncommunicatable, except by what Josiah said, by the Spirit. So I'm hoping that you have your antennas up and that you are paying attention, and then while you're paying attention, that you're asking the Lord to speak to you today, because I think this is very important in our day and time to be able to understand there is an intimacy that goes both ways. Hear, hear what I'm saying. The Lord is desiring to be intimate with you. Okay? He's desiring to be intimate with you. And he wants us to be intimate with him because he's a jealous God. Right? And some of y'all might say, well, jealousy is not a positive emotion. But jealousy is, is a very powerful emotion for a sovereign God. And today I want to explain to you why he's jealous. Because some of you have not even thought about what I'm about to talk about today. And I think if you really meditate on it, it'll change the way you walk with God. Okay? Which is part of my job. All right. So we want to start with uh, Deuteronomy 30. 16 through 18. Deuteronomy 30, 16 through 18. Now, I use the New American Standard Bible. You may have the NIV, but I, I don't think we should have any problems with the translation here. It says, in that command, I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways and keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments that you may live and multiply, and that the Lord your God may bless you in the land where you are entering to possess it. Now, this is Moses talking to the children of Israel about moving into the promised land. And he's talking to them and giving them instructions before he leaves to go die because he disobeyed the Lord in anger, and the Lord told him he wasn't going to go over but he would see it. Verse 17. But if your heart turns away and you will not obey, but are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall surely perish. You will not prolong your days in the land where you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess it. What is worship? The definition of worship used in this verse of scripture is to bow down and prostrate yourself. 
So when you read the Old Testament and you see that they talked about they worship or they bowed down, it's not like we traditionally think. Prostrating yourself means to totally lay with your chest on the ground and totally spread out. That is prostrate. Okay, so when they came and bowed down to the Lord and they, they did it that way, that's total submission. That is total, total. I'm not on my knees looking around thinking, you know, they came and did that. Now, how many of y'all remember who Mordecai is? Okay, Mordecai was uh, the keeper of the gates during the time of Xerxes, during the time of Esther. And he's found in the book of Esther. Now, Haman hated Mordecai because Mordecai would not honor him. And how they did it back in Persia if somebody of the official royal company came around, they would prostrate themselves. And Haman hated Mordecai because Mordecai said, nunca, nunca. <laughs> Mordecai says, I'm never going to do that to a man. That only belongs to my God. And that's why Haman started to want to kill all the Jews because all the Jews did that. They did not do it. They was not going to bow down and prostrate themselves to anybody because that action belonged to God and God alone. Okay, so when you see that, if you ever go and see, and when they do that, that's what they're doing. And they're doing that and being true to the scriptures because that's the kind of bowing down that they gave to the Lord. Man. That's intense. And so when we talk about what worship is, in that portion of Scripture, it's talking about bow bowing down and prostrating oneself. Along with this idea of worship has to do with the pursuit of a deity with your thoughts, your actions, your aspirations, and your desires. So worship is not only how we posture ourselves. Worship is not only what we say out of our mouths. But worship is how we live our lives. Amen. Worship is not just one phase of your life. Worship is every phase of your life. Everything about you is worship. Uh, and so when we start talking about worship, we, have, we, we compartmentalize it. We go like, okay, I'm going to church on Sunday from a certain amount of time and I'm going to worship God. But when we walk out the church, we forget that God is still with us and how we interact shows if we worship him or not. And so what we have to realize is why is that important? Why is that important that God is requiring that? And we're going to continue. Jesus spoke about this kind of worship as in spirit and truth. He said, this is how you worship in spirit and truth. Remember what Jesus said. Jesus said, there's coming a time and now is when God's not looking for people who worship him in temples or on mountains, but that people he is looking and desiring for those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. Okay, here's the thing. We're seeking to break this down a little bit. All right. So can anybody tell me what I'm thinking right now? You're, you're, you're wrong, but that's a good thought. Okay, can anybody tell me what I'm thinking? The answer is no, you cannot tell me what I'm thinking. Because even if you tell me what I'm thinking, I'm going to quickly think something else. Okay, what I want to tell you is this. Every thought is spiritual because it's non-material. Everybody say non-material. Everything that is non-material is spirit. Everything. If you can't see it, touch it, taste it, it's spirit. Non-material. That means it exists in a realm you can't control, that you can't manipulate, and you cannot touch. It's non-material. So every thought I have is spirit. Every thought. So that's why Jesus said, 
if a man looks at a woman and lusts after him. Ah, what goes on up here is spirit. And it is judged first in the mind before it is as you act. So everything that's non-material is spirit. Everything. So every time we are awake and walking around and living, we are living in a material and non-material state. In your non-material state, to God it is, is you are in your natural state. So as I'm thinking about contemplating stuff, I'm doing that in the spirit. And if I'm doing it in the spirit, big S, not little s, then I'm being led, directed, and, 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 uh, and I'm working out life things with God in my mind, in my conscience. He's dealing with me in that place, in spirit. Now, if I'm following him, then what we come up with as we grapple with ideas as we grapple with actions, as we grapple with what I'm thinking in my mind, as I'm starting to deal with anxiety and fear and all of that stuff, which all are non-material, when I learn to deal with those with the big S and not the little S, then what happens is the actions after that contemplation are called truth. Truth. Now, Jesus spent his whole time trying to introduce the kingdom of God to everybody who would listen because the kingdom of God functions in spirit and in truth. So when we worship God, the type of worshiper that God is looking for is those in the non-material realm that he can direct, that he can lead, that he can convince, that he can walk with, that he can speak things to, he is looking for that person and those things that he works out with them as they walk will, uh, as they start to live life, will convey and manifest his truth. Everybody say spirit and truth. Okay. Those are the two areas that we walk in intimacy with God. In your mental, emotional, a non-material place and then the natural place where you deal with people deal with situations and even your own self that's the kind of worship of God's looking for that's what Jesus talked about spirit and truth non-material material so when we start to understand those aspects our relationship with the sovereign God who does not have a shape or a form but is powerful and present past and future starts to influence the way we live life we now move from a natural understanding to a supernatural understanding you get what I'm saying you move from just understanding natural wisdom and the things that are common to, to, to this earth and you start now moving into a realm where God starts showing you things above the natural. Remember what Corinthians talked about said, the spirit of God is in us to, to, to search the depths of God to reveal to us what is freely given to us. How are you going to know what's freely going to be given to you unless you connect with a God who is not material? You have to connect with him in the non-material realm. But guess who else is in the non-material realm? You guessed it. The devil. He's in the non-material realm too. And as you start to think and ruminate, everybody say ruminate. Ruminate is like marinate. You know, we talked about that. How you do, how something was done to you and you think about it over and over again. Some of y'all are like slow cookers. Somebody do something to you, you crock pot that thing. You be thinking about that thing for like weeks. That meat so tender you can't even see it no more. That stuff's oatmeal. It's been cooking in that pot so long. Well, God wants to deal with that rumination 
and start to give you non-material principles that cause you to live in power in your spirit. That's what he wants to do. Well, guess what? That doesn't happen outside of intimacy. It doesn't happen outside of intimacy. It doesn't even happen if you go to seminary. That don't happen like that. It doesn't, it doesn't even happen if you, if you spend 35 to 40 hours in a soaking room. It still won't guarantee you that it'll happen. Because intimacy has to do with the will. With the will. I've been married 38 years. There is not another woman on the face of this earth, clothed or naked, that could ever get me to turn my mind from my wife. Not one. I don't care who you are. Get your nasty self away from me. <laughs> it's just not happening. And the reason why it's not happening is because I love my wife, but I love my God more than I do my wife. That would be an offense to him. I would violate intimacy if I did that. Violated it big time. To the point where it will almost wreck me. Therefore, there is not a temptation that I am willing to take because it costs too much. Costs too much. I heard a man tell one of his daughters one day, he said, you know what? You think you have a big bank account. And you, you like to write checks that you can't catch. In other words, you think that you got all the wisdom in the world to get out of stuff you get into. But your bank account ain't that big. And because some of us believe that we're wise enough to be able to do things and get away with it, we work in the material realm, but we call ourselves intimate with God. We have to check that and make sure that we're not lying to ourselves because we can easily do that. We have to make sure. Jesus, God in the form of Jesus, came down in the form of a man and served him by paying a price that man could never get close to. Why did he do this? Because he loves humanity. Because he made it in his image. Look at your neighbor next to you and say, God made you in his image. He made a male and female. He created them. This cannot be overstated. We were made for his presence and only his pleasure. We was made for his pleasure and his presence. Our worship to him is unique and glorious. It was designed, put in us, so that we may walk with him and fellowship with him. That is what we had until the fall. God executed a plan to bring worship for him and us back into his rightful place. The scriptures that we just read is a warning on how to lose intimacy. God was through Moses telling them what being drawn away will cause in their intimacy. If we look at the term drawn away, it literally means to thrust away, to banish. The word thrust is to be pushed violently away in a different direction. So if I thrust against you, I'm pushing you from where you are to where I want you to be, violently. It's not something that is, that is tender or, or nice. It's a violent, aggressive move. So when we talk about the word drawn away, it has inside of it this term or this idea of being thrusted away. Thrusted away. The word trust, that, I mean, still not trust, the word thrust is a spiritual word. So Moses is admonishing them not to be violently pushed away from the embrace of the Lord. 
To further emphasize that worship is not just what you say, but also what you do, he goes on to say to serve other gods. This word serve means to serve as subjects. That means come underneath and obey someone's commands. Mm. In other words, do their bidding. Now, I'm going to stop right here real quick and talk about that word thrust really quickly. Now, if I'm, if I'm walking with God, we're talking about non-material. I'm not talking about material because all of us understand what material thrusting is. We've all done it one way or another. Okay. Uh, but I want to talk about non-material thrusting. Remember the two people that, that rule the non-material world, the two beings, the father and the devil. And so I want to talk to you quickly about things that thrust you away from God. One of the things that thrust us that pretend or will attempt to do it are situations. Things that you go through. Things that happen to common man. Things that happen to everybody. It rains on the just and the unjust. We get what everybody get. Just because you say don't mean life don't happen to you. God doesn't have to change life because he's overcome everything. So now God uses life to deepen your intimacy. I'll say that again. God uses life to deepen your intimacy. And each one of us are in the school of Jesus Christ. If you accepted him as your Lord, you're in school. Everybody say, I'm in school. So when you are in school, what are you in there to do, Joel, when you're in school? You're in there to learn, right? Not to be a knucklehead. How many of y'all was knuckleheads in school? I wish they bring beating back to school, man. Beating a square away, a lot of knuckleheads. Bible talked about folly is taken out from back here. That's what the Bible said. Spare the rod. See, some of y'all believe in that. I'm not talking about, you know, use the rod and kill the child. Back in the day, boy, woo, man, I used to get hit with anything. I used to walk around the house and see what were weapons and kind of move them to different places. <laughs> Any of y'all ever did that? Any of y'all ever did that, huh? And, and my brothers and sisters, we had a communication, we had agreement in communication. If Ma asked you to go outside and get a switch, you better come back in with something reasonable. Because if you don't, when it's your turn, I'm coming back in with a branch. You gotta come, you gotta come inside with something reasonable. You can't come out. Ma says, go back out there and find me something else. And then she would say, you come back in here with something, some, I'm going to go out there and find one whip both y'all. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not getting whipped for you. I tried. I'm going to come back in with something adequate. So as we start going through life and experiencing things, we start to make decisions about what's going on in our lives in the non-material realm. Let's say, for instance, you get cancer. Let's say you contracted cancer, okay, and you say, praise God, I ain't receiving that. I'll stand there. You still got cancer. So why did God allow cancer to come into your life? Notice what I said, allowed. Why did he allow it to come into your life? Why did he allow the stroke to come into your life? Why did he allow the diabetes? Why did he allow the divorce? Why did he allow that stuff? First of all, God gets credit for a lot of things he ain't got nothing to do with. Those are our choices that we made. But God has mercy. Everybody say mercy. Mercy, mercy has to do with the consequences. God intervenes in your consequences. Sometimes he don't let that truck hit you in the face. Sometimes he let it hit you in the shoulder. 
<laughs> because if it hits you in the face, it'll take your head off. But God allows life to bring you deeper. Now, the decisions you make during that time frame will see if you get violently thrusted from your intimacy. How you see your situations will either give the devil ammunition or give God the praise. Amen. Whichever one you do depends on how close you are to him. God's trying to bring you closer. Remember, he struggled with Jacob all night and made him limp for the rest of his life so he can get him to ask him to change his name. Some of us, God got to break our arm, our hip, pull out some hair. He got to do all this stuff before we say, okay, Lord, I want you to bless me. Can somebody say amen? The rest of y'all say, oh, my. I'm trying to tell you that everything that happened to you in your life is about determining how intimate you will be with God or if you will be violently thrusted away by the enemy. Your expectations on God are neither right nor wrong. They're indifferent. But when he brings things into your life and shows you his mercy and his grace and then take them and take them and move you to a place you weren't before, you will say, what a mighty God we serve. And if you don't, you are not intimate. You are indifferent to the presence of God. Because everything that doesn't break you will make you and God's not interested in breaking you he's interested in making you and conforming you into the image of his son but how and what will we say when we are in the middle of a trial will we worship him in spirit and in truth or will we put him on trial God does not deserve to be on trial. He doesn't have to do another thing for me for him to be sovereign, right, and perfect. The reason why is because I understand something about living. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded from the mouth of the Lord. Do you know in your hard times, in your hard times, saints, do you know you are so, you, you, you are so in a position to hear the sweetness of God? How many of y'all can testify to that? Amen. How many of y'all can testify? Amen. In my hard times, I heard the sweetness of God. Amen. I felt this presence. I felt this sweetness speak to me. But here I want to tell you something. He's always speaking like that. <laughs> He's always speaking like that. But I'm not always in a position to humbly hear him like that. I'm talking about intimacy. So when life comes around and hard times hit us, we have a tendency to push away everything that don't mean nothing. And the only one that's still standing there is the one who made humanity and says it's mine. And I'm going to be here, hell or high water. David said, if I make my bed in hell, there you are. Because I love you and I'm going to prove it. When them hard times hit you, I'm going to be there. When you walk through the fire, I'll be with you. When the water overtake you, I'll bring you through. He'll be standing there when everybody's gone. And he'll be embracing you when you stink. When you think you're the worst you can ever be, He's there to give you grace, to encourage you. You still mine. 
One time, I, one time I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, do you know what you bought? <laughs> Man, Lord, I'm, I'm just no good. I just don't I, don't, I don't even know why you would want to be with me. The revelation came to me that uh, I know you're flawed, but I made you. You mine. I can fix you. Matter of fact, I have fixed you. Amen. Wait a minute. We're talking non material. He's not talking to you materially. He lives in eternity, he sees it all. You only see snapshots, he sees the panoramic picture. He knows exactly what's happening. Why? Because he's intimate. He's in this thing way deeper than what we think. We think, we think that God makes decisions like us. He does not. <laughs> he's making decisions in the non-material, in the spirit that you don't even know about. Here's what the scripture said. For I know he is able to do far and above and exceedingly what I can ask or think. Wow. I don't even know how to ask him for the things he's getting ready to do for me. I don't even know how to conceive it. But as I continue to walk with him day by day and take my challenges knowing that he loves me enough that when he got what he wants, he's going to say, that's enough. When God has what he wants, he's going to say, that's enough. The devil, ain't, the devil is not in control of anything. He doesn't have any power. He's just being allowed to do something because God want to do something. Amen? Amen. He's just allowed to do something because God want to do something. Why you say that, Brother T.C.? Because I read the book of Job. Who do you think picked that fight? It wasn't the devil. It was God. God's like, hey, hey, hey. Hey, devil, what you been doing? I've been messing with people and turning their lives up. <laughs> Good. Have you considered Job? Oh, here we go. This Job dude again. Yeah. He's an upright man, and he praises me, and he loves me. What do you think? Well, I know why. Because you protect him. If you let me get at him, I'll make him curse you to your, to your face. Oh, seriously. Bet. Let's go. That's my translation. That's a Negro... <laughs> That's a Negro hood translation. You ain't going to find that nowhere. I, I ain't put my version out yet. <laughs> that's, the, <laughs> that's the BP version. The BP, the BPB Bible. The Black Project Bible. I ain't put that. <laughs> I haven't put that out yet. He said, bet. Let's do it. But don't touch, don't, you know, don't touch his body. What? God told him, don't touch his body. I thought the devil could do whatever he wanted to do. Don't touch his body. You can do anything else, but don't touch his body. Okay. Wham, 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 wham. Did all kinds of stuff. What did Joel say? Yeah, well, he slayed me, though I trust him. Ooh. Let me tell you all something, man. Job had an intimacy with God that was second to none, man. He decided, I'm not going to let situations, even in the loss of my children, cause me to curse God and die. Never going to do it. His wife even told him, curse God and die. He's like, no. You go back to the house. Get you up to the house. <laughs> what you talking about? Curse God and die. Even in his confusion, he would never curse God. He was confused. Don't get me wrong. I'm confused sometimes. 
I was confused when, in 2017 when I got cancer and I got leukemia. I was confused. I was sitting in front of the doctor saying, um, y'all got a pill or something, right? I can take a pill or something, you know? Because I was getting ready to catch a plane on that Thursday. This was Tuesday. I was about to catch a plane and go to Virginia. I, my, my oldest brother anniversary. He was turning 82. I was like, man, I'm going to go see my bro, man. I'm going up there. I, everything was set, plane ticket, everything. I'm sitting in there. He says, yes, you have APL, you have leukemia. And I'm like, okay, give me something. Right? The doctor looked at me like I was crazy. I'm like, I got a plane to catch. I got to go to Virginia on Thursday. Mr. Christian, you are not going to Virginia on Thursday. Matter of fact, you ain't even leaving this hospital. I'm like, what? He said, you, you are extremely sick. And I was feeling good. I could, let's go. <laughs> I don't feel nothing. The doctor said, the reason why you don't feel anything is because you don't have an immune system. What do you mean? He says, you know when you sneeze and mucus come out of mucus, not mucus, mucus, come out of your nose? You know when you cough up phlegm and do all of that stuff? That's your immune system. It's telling you that it's working. You have none. That's why you don't feel nothing. Matter of fact, if you get on that plane, you ain't coming back. My immune system was so low that if I'd have sat next to somebody who had a cold, I would have died. But I was feeling nothing. So thank the Lord for your immune system when you're rubbing your nose and you're blowing in everything else. Because your immune system's doing its thing. But if you ain't feeling nothing, that's a problem. And I was feeling nothing. And the doctor sat me down, Christian doctor, I'll never forget her. I, they put me in the room, I was sitting on the bed, I was like confused. I was like, man, are y'all playing with me, man? Y'all guinea pig me? What's going on? I don't feel anything. She rolled a chair up to me, looked me straight in the face. She says, Mr. Christian, you are a very sick man. <laughs> you are a very sick man. I cannot express to you how sick you are. And then it started to dawn on me, like, these guys are serious. And she says, and you need to pray that the Lord will lead you through this valley. That's when it hit me. Booms. Oh, my gosh. And I was saying to myself, I got leukemia? Y'all remember that lady on that thing? Ain't nobody got time for this. <laughs> I, got, I got bronchitis. <laughs> ain't nobody got time for I ain't got time for this. The Lord says, oh, this is the exact time for this. Because I'm going to reveal something to you you don't know. I'm going to show you something about me that you never saw before. But at that moment... I was confused. How many of you guys feel confused sometimes? Mm -hmm. You feel confused. Man, I'm confused. Why is this happening to me? I don't understand it. God is not confused. This is about intimacy. You can make it about you, but it's really about him. How did God get all these names? I was wondering about that. How do they call him Jehovah Jireh? How did he become Jehovah Rapha? How did he become Jehovah Teniskaku? How did he come, how did he get all of those names? Because all of those things describe who he is. So in your intimacy with God, in your worship to him, in you prostrating your material and non-material self to him, you are going to know him in every one of those names. You're going to know him as your healer. Why? Because you're going to be sick. It's common to humanity. You're going to be sick. I know some of y'all, you know, you got Teflon, but you're going to get sick. 
COVID proved that to everybody. You are going to get sick. You are going to be in lack. You are going to have an enemy greater than you. You are going to be in a position where you are feeling like you're walking through the valley of the shadow of death. You are going to feel rejection, betrayal, and denial. You're going to feel it all. And you're not going to just feel it all once in your life. You're going to feel it maybe, possibly, many times. Like a sister once said, all of us got issues and tissues. And the VA clinic calling me, man, don't they know it's Sunday? All of us got issues and tissues. But in the middle of all of that, God wants to bring us to a place where you and him walk through something together. And you walk through it with you understanding that he knows the way, that he can bring you comfort. That he can make you understand when it's time to understand. So God said something to me I'm going to say to you today. And hopefully it will bless you like it blessed me. God said two things to me that changed my theology. How many of y'all ready for your theology to change? Amen. Okay, I'm going to do it today. I promise you. He told me, son, never make decisions about what I'm doing or who I am in the middle of a trial. I encourage you today. Do not make decisions about who God is in the middle of your mess. Just praise him. Amen. Just worship him. Just prostrate yourself before him. The second thing he told me was this. In the middle of something hard, be careful. Because the pain, the disappointment, and the rejection is trying to get you to worship it. Do not worship it. Worship me. Amen. Seek my presence in your pain, and the pain will go away. Amen. Notice what I said. The pain is material. When I said move away from the pain, I'm talking about non-material. What the pain brought to you to say. What the pain is proclaiming. Walk away from what is proclaiming. And walk straight into the shadow of my wings. <laughs> Never make a decision about what God's doing in the middle of a trial. Number two, don't worship the situation. In other words, don't give it that much attention that it starts to sway how you think about God in the non-material. And he will bring you through. Understand what the scriptures say. Weeping endures for a night. What comes in the morning? Mm. I want to tell you that you're serving an intimate God. But the God that you serve that's intimate. Is intimate in the middle of life. How many of you guys have went through seasons where you just felt the joy, the peace, and the power of God like flowing over you like the wind? How many of y'all have went through that? You know what that was? Anesthesia. You need to learn how to enjoy anesthesia. Because right after that, here it comes. And then it happened. In the Bible, it has that phrase, and then it happened. And then it happened. Whenever you read that, you go, oh my, and then it happened. God sometimes prepares us for what is about to happen. What is about to happen. Sometimes you could, you could be feeling so great. You, I mean, everything's going right, and you're talking about this, and then all of a sudden, here comes a non-material challenge to what you think about God. It's coming around the corner, 
and it's coming around the corner when she comes. And when it happens, everything that tastes good tastes bad. Every relationship that you have is not sufficient. And everything that you thought was a pillar in your life starts to crumble. Hang on. Because the one who loves you, the one who will never leave you, the one who is your rock is always there. God don't get mad when you ignore him. God gets mad when you try to replace him. We can go through life and go through stuff and we get into this, this rat race and we forget about the Lord. We forget to, to be with him in the non-material realm. We forget to, to read and to meditate and to pray. We forget to do that stuff because we get caught up in it. But that, I, I, I'm not too concerned about that. What I'm concerned about is when we replace him with something else. That's called idolatry. Everybody say idolatry. We have to be careful of what idolatry is because idolatry is an attempt of the devil to get you to worship him. Did you know that this whole thing between God and the devil is about worship? It's about worship. It is, it is, the, it is the financial Currency in the non-material realm. Worship. It's very valuable. And the reason why God doesn't want anything else to be worshipped is because his worship is based on affection. I love you. I, I, I gave my life for you. I shed my blood for you. I love you. I, 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 I made you. I took part of me and made you. You have all the essence of who I am. You are man, and I made you for myself. And I made you so uniquely connected to me that I made you out of me. Amen. Right? The greatest creation God ever made is you and me. Because we're in his image. The devil knows that. So there is power in a human being when they worship. Do you hear me? There's power in a human being worshiping. God knows it because he's sharing. We were meant for him, not for other things. But we therefore empower things when we worship him. That's why the devil wants worship because we empower him when we worship anything other than God. Why, does I, why do I say that's true? Matthew chapter 4, 8 through 10, and I'll be done when we look at this. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Wait, this is the son of God and the devil is trying to get him to worship him? Do y'all understand that? I do. Because Jesus is fully God and fully man. And if I can get the man part to worship I'm empowered. So the devil was after Jesus' worship as a man. So if he was after him, what do you think he's after for us? He wants us to ignore God and to worship anything else but the Lord because that benefits him. If he could come at Jesus, I stand no chance unless I'm intimate with the Father. Then Jesus said in verse 10, Go, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Here we see clearly what the enemy desires. 
If this is what he wanted from Jesus, he wants the same from us. This is why we must always understand to, that to have intimacy with the one who designed you, for it is there you must fight the fight of faith so that you will not be drawn away. The enemy wants to thrust you away from God, thrust you away from the power of your existence, thrust you away from the promises that he made to you because he made them from his heart towards us. He wants to thrust us from the, the, the portion of scripture that said God causes all things to work together for the good. He wants to thrust us from those ideas, even though they're true. He's trying to push us away so he can get us in the dark place and cause us to believe that the God that made us doesn't want anything to do with us. That's what it's all about. So think about your life right now. Think about the things you're going through. Think about the things you're contemplating. Where do they come from? Why am I thinking like that? Is that, what, is that intimacy with God, the God I want to serve? In the non-material realm, this is where the battle is, in non-material. How am I thinking about the Lord? What do I think about that? What do I think about this? Is that pleasing to him? Am I prostrating my mind to my God? See, that's the problem. So when Timothy starts talking about this, the last days, and he has that list of attitudes that are in the church, having a form of godliness, but denying the power? That's what we're talking about. How we treat each other in our own homes? How do we treat each other in this place? How do we see each other? Do you know nobody cares about whether you preach or teach or do anything? This is what people care about. Do you all love each other? The Bible says, they will know you're my disciples if you have what for one another? Love. Man, that's non-material. How can I love somebody that's not biologically connected to me? In the spirit. That's how you love them. And then... In the non-material realm, you start to connect in a relationship that will a, a, a express the non-material. We're family. Everybody say family. We're family. We're family. So I'll close with this. A young man asked me a question. He said, Pastor TC, I don't believe in this, I don't, I don't believe in this church thing. I don't, think you have, I don't think you need to go to church to be a Christian. I told him, well, that's probably true. I said, but you have to be one to stay one. You want to stay one, you need to go to church. He said, man, I still don't feel like that. I said, well, let me give you an example. I said, you got a grandpa? He said, yeah. I said, you love your grandpa? He said, yeah, I love my grandpa. My grandpa like my dad. I said, good. That's cool. I never knew my grandpa's. Neither one of them, but I'm glad you do. That's something I always wanted to know. I said, hey, what if your grandpa said uh, about two weeks from now that uh, he was going to invite you to dinner? He said, oh, 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 yeah. I said, he's done that before. I said, cool. I said, so just imagine this, right? All the grandchildren are at the table. They've already gotten there. And for some strange reason, you decide to go to a Spurs game. Okay. You knew in advance that Grandpa was inviting you to dinner. You knew that. And you had made plans. But then all of a sudden, somebody said, hey, man, I got some tickets, man, on the floor. I got these tickets from a vendor. He told me, hey, man, go to the game. You know, I bought some stuff from him for a company. And, man, we right there on the floor, man. You want to go? Does monkeys fly? No, I'm just joking. No. <laughs> do you want to go? Yeah, man. I, man, I go. I go. I'm going to do it. Okay. You totally forgot. 
that grandpa had set a date for dinner. All the grandkids at the table, right? Grandpa looked from the head table. Y'all know how grandpas do. I've been around other people's grandpas, so that's how I know. They're like, anybody seeing Jose? Can you see? <laughs> Anybody seen Jose? No, Grandpa, I ain't seen him. Did, did he know about the dinner tonight? Well, he told me last week he was coming. Okay. Don't you know nobody's sitting in Jose's seat? Because Grandpa ain't going to let him. That's his seat, right? That's, that's my grandson's seat. All y'all my grandsons and granddaughters too, but that's his seat. Because grandpas and grandmas, they like to see everybody. All, their grandkids are all the same. Parents may be different, but them grandkids, every last one of them. I look at, I look at my grandkids individually. Boy, I love them. Man, I got a love for my grandkids. He's not in that chair. I said, what do you think Grandpa thinking, man? He said, Grandpa pissed. <laughs> I said, yeah, he is. I said, that? I said, you said, what? Would you ever do that to your Grandpa? No, I wouldn't do it to my, I would not do that to my Grandpa. I love my Grandpa too much. I wouldn't want to face him if I told him I was going to be somewhere and didn't show up. I said, yeah, that's pretty interesting. Your seat in church is yours and it's empty and your father looking for you. That seat is intimate to the grandfather because my grandson sits there. So is your chair intimate to the father because you sit there. We need to stop playing around, man. We're not serving something in a comic book. We're serving an intimate God who loves us, paid the price for us. He's there when nobody else is there. He says, come and let me love you, and I'll show you how to love. Don't be missing, because I love my children, and I want you to be in your seat. Because what I have to serve today, it's going to taste real good, and I want to see your face smile. Why does God have to see us go through pain, and then we reject him when, we, when the rain stops? Why are we only there when it rains? He wants to enjoy all of it because all of it is about him and it's about me and it's about you. It's about intimacy because he does not want us violently thrusted away from him by, the, by an enemy that came to rob, kill, and destroy. Stand to your feet today. It's an old song that I like. It's called Be Magnified. And one of the lines in it says, I have made you too small in my eyes. Oh, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me, Lord. For I have listened to them and believed in a lie that you are unable to help me. But, oh, Lord, I see my wrong. Heal my heart and show yourself strong. Amen. And in my mind and in my life, oh Lord, be magnified. Love that song. That's how I feel today. I made you too small. I made everything else bigger than you. Forgive me, Lord. I believed in a lie that you were unable to help me. I see my wrong. Heal my heart and show yourself strong. And I promise in the material and in the non-material realm, I'll glorify your name. 
Not by just how I think, but how I live. Oh, Lord, be magnified. It's a powerful song. Some of you old saints might know it. But today, I just want us to take some time and just magnify him. Say in your heart, Lord, I made you too small. I made you too small in my eyes. I've let other things take your place. I let other things encourage me that shouldn't have. I allowed the rat race of life to make you look small. I'm sorry. I don't want to be violently thrusted away from your presence. I want you to be magnified. You found it. Turn it up, Matt. I have made you too small. A V on it, boy. My eyes. Oh Lord. Turn that up for me, bro. Forgive me. And I have believed in a lie that you were unable to help me. Sing it with us. Be magnified. Be magnified. We love you, Lord. We lift you up. I have made you too small. Help us to go through life uh, 
understanding the great love you have for us and how you never want us to be thrusted away from you by the hater of our souls because you're the lover of our souls you know sometimes we go through things we're confused and we don't know which way to turn But if we would just move closer to you and understand you, your desire is greater than what we could ever know. We would trust that you are teaching us the intimacy in worship. In my non-material place where you live, in my material interaction, where you are explained and manifested. Teach me how to worship you in spirit and in truth. Not in my flesh, not in my imagination, but in the place that you made for you and me to commune together. That I will get courage from you to be brave when I need to but understand my place with you is to humbly humbly acknowledge you in all my ways in Micah chapter 6 you say through the prophet what has God required from you O man but to do justice, to love mercy or loving kindness and walk humbly with your God. To walk in a lowly submitted place for in that place is where true power, love, peace and acceptance exists. By your spirit today, Father, I hope and I know that you have revealed this truth to your children as the word was being preached and as you caused it to be felt. Let us meditate on it and not only be hearers of the word, but be doers of the word. Because when we do, we worship. When we hear, we worship. When we meditate, we worship. And when we look to you for everything we need, we worship. Our lives is worship. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your presence being here today. In the presence of the Lord, there is freedom. And I might add, there's no questions because all of them are answered in the spirit. We thank you, Father, and we give you praise. Help us today this very day to continue to worship you as we walk out these doors and tomorrow and the next day in all the days that are left in our existence here before we live with you forever in eternity we give you all the praise in Jesus name amen can you get a Lord of praise in this house today can you shout the voice of triumph can you hear him? hallelujah thank you Jesus Hallelujah. Amen. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. May his countenance be upon you and may he give you peace in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you guys. See you next week.